The Lord says, I'm God who changes not. I will never leave you or forsake you. Have I not said it and shall I not do it? For I'm the one who is here, I am with you, and I shall be with you from here until eternity. For I do not change. I have said it, I have decreed it, and I shall bring it to pass, says the Lord. For I have said that I will move and I am moving, and I am doing much in the preparation and that which you cannot see. And I'm bringing those and I'm drawing those. And I do hear your prayer, says the Lord, for I shall bring it to pass. I shall have this move which I have promised, and it shall be greater than you think. It shall be greater than you see. So I ask you to lift your eyes, lift your eyes, lift your eyes to me, says the Lord, for I shall bring it. I shall do it. I am the one who will back my word. I am the one who does not change, and I have not changed, and I will not change, and I will do what I said I would do. So be encouraged, says the Lord, for I am with you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that. I really want to continue on from that which God has been speaking to us over the last few weeks about faith. You know, when Mark Johnson was here, he, he said, you know, he wanted to speak us, to us about activating our faith. Last week, Neil spoke to us about being obedient to that which God says to us. You know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I don't know about you, but I want to please God. I want God to smile at me. You know, <coughs> God... <laughs> God is in a good mood. <laughs> He's in a good mood. In his presence is fullness of joy. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago with the young adults and just talking about the joy that Jesus brings. He brings joy. You know, he's got liberty. There's nothing getting him down. <laughs> There's nothing worrying him. Nobody's put oil on his throne and he slipped off. You know, he just... <laughs> he's, he's in a good mood. <laughs> God is in, he's in a good mood. But, you know, the Bible says, all those that believe in them, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. He gives us power to be his sons. I've got a couple of sons, and surprisingly enough, they're incredibly good looking like me. <laughs> But they take after me. They take after me. And God wants us to take after him. And God is a God of faith. He's a God who made a declaration and he spoke and the worlds came into being. There's something spiritual about this. It's not just trust. God didn't just trust and speak. He spoke out of something spirit. He spoke and the creative power of God exploded forth and the world came into being. Hebrews 1 says, God upholds all things by the word of his power. He's a God of faith. And as sons of God, he wants us to be people who walk in faith. Not just to have a, 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 a shift of values, a shift of heart, but people who operate in this realm of the spirit and walk with God and know how to operate like God as his sons. The Bible says the whole of creation, it says in Hebrews, I believe, the whole of creation is waiting for the manifestation. It groans earnestly, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. He's waiting for us to step in. The whole of creation is waiting for us to step in to what God has called us to be. We've got to step into this place of sonship, that we are sons. And, uh, you know, we want to please God with our faith. This verse always, one of the verses, 1 Peter 1 verse 7, says this, if we can have it up, Alec. <clears throat> it's a, it's a, just an incredible verse that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus. Right, there was a, is that the verse? What's the one before that? It mustn't be up there. The trial of your faith is more precious than gold. It says in my, my version, the trial of our faith. I think, God, why do you want to try our faith? What is it about the, the trial of faith that is precious to God? It's precious. You know, I, I used to say that I have a, a love-hate relationship with this verse. You know, God loves it and I hate it. But it's the word of God, so I need to shift. <laughs> I need to love it. What, what is it about the trial of faith that is precious that is more precious than gold. Does anybody like gold? Nobody. What a holy bunch you are. <laughs> a couple of honest ladies. 
I'm, I'm wearing... Oh, and you. Oh, I've got, I've got a gold ring here because it's precious. It's, it's precious not just in the value of the metal but in what the whole thing symbolises. My relationship, my covenant, it's precious. But the Bible says the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. That's a big statement from God. It's more precious. So if the trial of our faith is something to highly value, then we should highly value it also. Hello, you with me? It's the trial of our faith. So why does God want to try this thing? And, I, and I've just been working through this with God as, as God has been challenging us to step up in faith and lay a hold of him and believe him and see the answers from heaven come to earth. And, and the trial of our faith is more precious. So how do we work through this? Jesus is coming back for a perfect bride, a mature bride. He's called us to be sons. He wants us to mature. In numbers of places in the word of God, it talks about being perfect, but the better word to translate is mature. He wants us to be mature Christians. He wants us to have a mature faith. You know, when I was a young man, uh, and uh, I wanted a mature bride, not an old one, but one who was fully developed. I know, you're looking at me sideways, but if we can do this without being crude, Jesus is coming back for a mature bride. Just understand this from God's perspective. And if we can put it in that context, that a young man wants a fully developed woman, he doesn't want a squalling baby. Are you with me? So if Jesus is coming back for a fully developed bride, which is us, the church, he doesn't want a squalling baby. This is where I'm going. Is this making sense now? Okay, without just getting all, you know, twisty. <laughs> Jesus wants a mature bride. So he wants us to mature. He, he wants us to grow into who he wants to come back for and, and you know, have that place of closeness and intimacy. And, and this, this is what the Bible says, that he's coming back for a mature bride. So it's up to us to do the maturing. There's nothing worse than seeing a person who is mature in age but yet not mature in years or character. To seeing old people throw a tantrum. It's, it's, it's not pretty. You know, when a snowman throws a tantrum, he has a meltdown. <laughs> I've got to throw in, I've got to lift this thing. Come on. Come on, stay with me. Stay with me. <laughs> so God wants us to mature. There are numbers of ways he wants us to mature and grow and develop. And we're looking at how we mature in faith. And this is one of the reasons that we have a trial of our faith, because without a trial, faith does not develop. So faith comes into this place of being tried. It's, more, it's very precious to God, this whole thing, because it develops us and matures us in our spiritual walk and our ability to trust and believe and walk with God and see the answers of heaven come to earth, which is what Jesus prayed. Your kingdom be down here like it is up there. That's the Lord's Prayer. Okay, so we've got to grow and develop in this thing and grow and mature in faith. <laughs> well, we have, of course, there's the whole character side. God wants us to grow in character and develop the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 24 talks about this. It talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the flesh. And God does work in our character. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. It's verse 20, Alec. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, uh, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. The list goes on. Of which I tell you beforehand, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we can focus on this just in terms of behaviour. That God wants something deeper than just a behaviour change. He wants us to walk in the life of the Spirit. Now the works of, of the, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, is that on there? Oh yeah? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness, self-control. Listen to this. Against such there is no law. There's no law against the fruit of the Spirit. There's no law against being kind. There's no law against loving one another. There's no law against these things. There is law against the flesh things, but there's no law against the life of the Spirit and walking in that place. There's no, it's not like you're not allowed, but it, how does God then encourage you into this place? He brings us through trials. So we press into God. We press into his answers. We press into the life of the Spirit. A couple of people were telling me before the meeting this morning about how would you go through life without Jesus. <laughs> about three or four people said the same thing to me. How would you get through all the stuff that goes on without Jesus? Because Jesus is the, the glory and the lifter of my head. He encourages us. He comes and he helps us. And we walk in faith with him to see the answers of God come through. The trials of the righteous are many, but the Lord delivers us from them all. God comes and he lifts our head and he, and he helps us and carries us. He's such a good God. <laughs> There's no law against the fruit of the Spirit. There's no law against it. It's the stuff of the flesh that he's trying to break and destroy. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and lusts. And it's up for us to bring and lay down these, these flesh things before God. Say, God, here it is. Nail me there. Let it die. God's got an answer for sin. It's called death. So the flesh stuff, it's dead. But how do we go on to mature? How do we want to mature in faith? Hebrews 12 is just this magnificent verse about God being our dad. Remember, we're talking about being sons. Now, if, God, if we're our son, then it means God is our father. Is that right? So if we're born of God, he wants us to overcome, and this is a victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So he leads us into a place where there is a trial so we can develop and grow in faith and overcome and be people who overcome. So if you're going through a trial, press into God and get the answers from heaven and be people who rise up in faith and see God come through for you. Hello? It's precious to God. I've lost Hebrews. Where's it gone? Here it is. <laughs> we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, this is verse 2, Endured the cross, despising the shame. So Jesus had this attitude that here's a, here's a trial, here's a difficulty, here's the cross. But I'm going to look beyond that to the joy. And sometimes all we can see is the cross. All we can see is the problem. All we see is the difficulty. All we see is the trial. But we've got to be able to have eyes of faith, for we walk by faith and not by sight, looking beyond the trial to the answer and the joy that is beyond it, to the victory. And we endure the trial for the purpose of the victory. And we go through it. What do they say if you're going through hell, don't stop? <laughs> Are you with me this morning? Come on, I'm just trying to encourage you because I do believe that God is speaking about this. He's speaking to me about it. It's encouraging me. I want it to be an encouragement to you that God will take us through. There is joy on the other side of this thing. For on the other side of death is resurrection. And God is good at that, I've found. <laughs> He's good at resurrection. He's resurrected me a couple of times through some trials, and I'm so incredibly grateful. I'm thinking, God, did I have to go through that? And I look at the other side, and, and He's changed me and matured me through those trials. I've allowed him to get on the inside, even though the stuff you know, is never fun at the time. <laughs> but it's more precious than gold to God. This is the verse that I want to get to. You've not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son. He's speaking to us as sons here. My son, do not despise the chastening or the discipline of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, for whom the Lord loves, 
he disciplines and scourges every son whom he receives. That's tough words from God, isn't it? Yeah. If we're going to be sons, we've got to line up for dad's discipline. We've got to allow him to discipline us. For if you are without discipline, if you endure discipline, God deals with your sons. For what son is there whom a father does not discipline? But if you are out it, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So this really struck me, that if I do not accept God's discipline in the area of faith, then I'm illegitimate. I'm thinking, how does this work? And God reminded me of Abraham. Abraham had an illegitimate son. He had a promise from God that he was going to have so many descendants and he didn't have any. He had his wife, Sarah. God spoke to her as well. And they, they, Sarah couldn't have kids and they weren't having children. They were getting old. And, and Sarah said, I know what I'll do. I've got my handmaiden here, Hagar. Now, this is a lot of pressure. You think about it. This is a lot of pressure for a woman to offer this to her husband. This is tough. There you go, Abraham. Go into my handmaiden and have a baby with her. That's pretty... I don't know about you, but I, I find that really would be a very difficult pressure for this lady to do that, to go to that length. So they did. They went in. Hagar had a baby called Ishmael. who was the son of the bondwoman. Illegitimate son. But God has purpose in all of this. And so they had an illegitimate son. God turns up again, straightens him up again. He says, no, I'm going to give you a son. So Abraham had to become a man of faith and believe what God said. Look at this in, in, in uh, Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. Just back over the page. By faith. Abraham was tested. He had his faith tested. He had a son, Isaac, with Sarah. He was tested. He offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Listen to what Isaac, uh, Abraham concluded. Concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, which he also received him in a figurative sense. So Abraham was tested, Firstly, by trying to have a, have a child, he had one that was illegitimate, but then he had the promise from God, and God tested his faith and said, come on, I want you to offer your son on, and, and you know, put him on the offering table. And they did. They went a three-day journey. And Isaac said, where's the offering? Abraham said, you're it. Up on the, up on the table, I'm going to, you know. That was a real test. Abraham had the knife raised. God said, hold it. Now I know that you believe me. And he said, look over there, there's a ram caught in a thicket. And offer that up instead. And because Abraham was willing to offer his only son as, a, as an act of faith, it was also a precursor in, in, a, in a picture that God was able to offer up his only son. That's why he's called the father of faith, because he believed God, concluding that, it, well, you know, Isaac, my seed is going to be called. If I slay my son on the altar, God is going to raise him from the dead. Had faith for resurrection, faith that was mature, faith that believed that what God said he was also going to do. Fully convinced. You said it, God, you're going to do it. It doesn't matter what happens between here and there. Somehow you're going to make this happen because you said it. You've got to understand that faith is not just you know, a thing on its own, but it's in the character and nature of who God is. That we believe that God is who he says he is and that he's going to back his word and do what he says he's going to do. That God is. For he who comes to God must first believe that he is. But to mature in a place of faith, 
we believe that he will do what he said he's going to do. How many of you have got a promise from God? That's not enough. Every one of us should have something we're believing God for. How many of you are believing God for something? Yeah, just most of us. We should be believing God for something. But faith comes by hearing God. So if you've got a hope and you've got a place, something that you're asking God for to work, stay in a place of prayer until you hear God about it. Can I encourage you? That's why we go to prayer meetings. And, and you know, we get into a place and then God speaks. And when God speaks, there's an impartation of his spirit to us, an impartation of his life, an impartation of faith to us, and we can take that as a seed. Faith comes as a seed. Then we water that seed by our expectation and by declaring and by locking a hold of that, of what God has spoken to us in our heart and allowing that to mature and go through the trial. And it goes through, sometimes the trial is just patience. For by faith and patience we emulate those who have received the promises. Sometimes it's just a period of time. God spoke to Abraham quite early in his life and it was many, many years later that he received the promise. He needed patience. You and I can hear from God. My wife heard from God uh, something like 15 years before we were married. Isn't that right? that God was going to give her a husband. I'm the fruit of her faith. And we have so many, many testimonies like this. But it's a trial. It's, it's something that God puts us through to prove do we believe. We've got to mature in our faith. So when we get that promise, okay, God, I'm believing you. I expect you to do it. I fully believe that what you have said, you're going to do. So it's not just a matter of, of you know, wanting God to do something. Stay in the place of prayer until you hear God. And then faith comes with it when he speaks. Is this making sense to you today? But then when God speaks, we've got to water that seed and allow it to grow through the place of trial. They say that when trees grow, if there's no wind, they do not develop a solid root system. So the trees need the, the wind to blow against them a little bit so that they put the roots down deep. And God wants our roots to grow down deep with him so we grow strong. And so we have lock a hold of the promise of God and when the trial comes, when sometimes you get a prophetic word, many of you had a prophetic word, and it's like everything is totally opposite to that word. It's like, gee, that doesn't look like. And so then what happens? The first thing that happens is we question whether it was from God. Maybe you're not like me. Maybe you're more mature in your faith than me. Was that really you, God? What is that? It's the trial of our faith. Are we going to lock a hold and allow that seed to flourish? Or are we going to pluck it out before it's even germinated? So we've got to water that seed. No, this is, might be what the circumstances and the situation say. Faith does not deny present reality. It doesn't say, well, you know, that doesn't exist. No, but it makes way for a better future. So we lock a hold of the seed of the word of God. This is what God said. The circumstances might be this, but I believe in who God says he is because he is going to do this thing regardless of what the picture is, regardless of what the circumstances are, God, you're going to do this, you're going to come through, you're going to make a difference. And, and as you water that seed, you grow strong, you put your roots down in faith into the character and who, the nature of who God is, and you stand strong and stand firm. And as you mature, when faith matures, it's like that mustard seed, tiny little seed, that when it grows, it bears much, much fruit. There's lots and lots of fruit that can be picked off a mustard tree. Hundreds of thousands of mustard seeds come off one mustard tree. And we've got to allow our fruit, our, our seed to flourish and to grow so we become people of faith, standing through the trial. Otherwise, we become illegitimate, like Ishmael. So what happened to Ishmael? Sarah decided after Isaac was born, I don't want them in the house. Kicked her out. You're out. Get out. 
to the animal, it was tough on them too. They were starving, they didn't have any water. There's a tiny little baby squalling. But because Ishmael was the seed of Abraham, God said, I will bless you, and he rescued them. So God still honours that seed. But Ishmael did not grow up in Abraham's household. He did not have the father's discipline. He did not grow up in that place where Abraham could speak into him and help him grow and mature. That came to Isaac, not to Ishmael. And then to Isaac's son. So God is known as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. No mention of Ishmael. He's the illegitimate son. Even though he was the son of the father of faith. Because he was illegitimate. Some of you are looking at, looking at me like, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, here's a good verse for you. Let's turn to it in, uh, where is it? Galatians 4.22. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. Galatians, after Corinthians. Galatians 4. Is that okay if I just teach a little bit on this? You with me? Galatians, for it is written that Abraham, 4.22, had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. For he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. And this is Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is, a, is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. So he's talking here about the two. In verse 29, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born of the spirit. And so it still happens. The sons of Ishmael are still persecuting the sons of Abraham. Of Isaac, should I say. It's still happening. And the spirit wars against the flesh. God wants us to be spirit people. That's about maturing our faith. That's why we have a trial of our faith. So we become people who walk in the Spirit and live according to the life of the Spirit and see the answers of the Spirit come onto earth and be Spirit people and see the life of the Spirit flourish and blossom and bring the answers of heaven to earth. You only do it by faith, as with all things with God, it's by faith. So we have this trial which matures our faith and we become people who can represent God. And when it's mature we see quick results. But when it's in its infancy, we're still putting in our roots, we've still got to water that seed. Here's another uh, verse for you. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, there was a lady, married to a man of course, that he had two wives. One was Elkanah and one was Hannah. Elkanah, oh sorry, one was, go to the next verse. He had two wives, the name was Hannah and the name of the other was Peninnah. Peninnah had children but Hannah had no children. Now, I don't want to read the whole chapter for you but the end of the story is that, that this man took his two wives up to the temple every year to offer towards God. But Hannah was so troubled because she could not have a child. She was barren. But that place of barrenness put her in this position where she cried out to God. And Eli, the high priest, thought she was drunk because she was mouthing words, but nothing was coming out. He said, don't come here drunk. And she said, no, Lord, but I'm, just in, I'm desperate for God to give me, for God to answer my prayer. And Eli didn't even know what the prayer was. And she was praying, God, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him to you. And this is how Samuel the prophet came to be. God answered her prayer. She gave birth to Samuel the prophet. When he was weaned, she brought him up and she gave him into the temple to grow up in the temple. And here we have this great man, Samuel the prophet, who grew up knowing God as his father and had the correction of God the father around his life and the ability to hear the voice of God 
And the Bible says at the end of his time, not one word fell to the ground from Samuel's lips. There was no um, stupid talk out of his mouth. Maybe you didn't tell dad jokes like me, I don't know. <laughs> but just it's an incredible man. Samuel the prophet was born out of this place from Hannah's barrenness and her cry towards God as she pressed into God. I encourage you, friends, if something looks, you know, you're going through some stuff, press into God and get an answer from God. Be a person who prays and presses in and hears from God and allow the answer of God to flow to you. The trial of our faith is not to destroy us. It's so that we press in and discover the answers of God. In the end of the verse, it says at the end of chapter 2, I believe, that Hannah went on to have another three sons and two daughters. So God fulfilled her. Even though she started off with an incredibly barren place, she gave birth to the great man, Samuel the prophet, who ushered in King David, the greatest king in Israel. That's what the Israelites say, so I've heard. They still honour him to this day. So there's a, there's a great legacy here that happens when we learn to walk with God and learn to usher in and become sons of God. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Now in Jewish culture, when a young man went through his bar mitzvah, he was able to then represent the Father. He would go into the marketplace and he could buy and sell for his Father and represent. That's what Jesus did. He represented the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he wants us to grow into this place as sons where if you've seen me, you see the Father. Where we represent God. Where we represent his faith. Where we represent his life, his character, who he is. Where we are ambassadors of Christ on this earth. And it's got to work not just in church, but in the marketplace. It's got to represent in the home got to represent in all the different aspects and spheres of life where we represent Christ, where we operate as sons. Not illegitimate, but people of God, mature faith. I was speaking, you know, last week, Deb and I had the privilege of having our grandchildren, or Deb's grandchildren, and uh, we went down to Brisbane on Friday and picked them up we just got them home and, uh, you know, it was late afternoon. It was time to feed them and, and wash them and get them ready for bed. And I had this phone call from a man who, who, you know, was homeless and he just wanted somebody to talk to. And, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I've got to go and speak to this guy who's down in Caloundra. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll come and talk to you. It was the most inconvenient time because I just got my grandchildren. And I'm driving down there. You know, and in my heart, I'm, I'm, I'm resenting having to go there and talk to this man. And I sit down with him. He was so drunk I could barely understand him. I'm thinking, you're keeping me away from time with my grandkids. And you know, he started telling me about his life. He, he's, he's ex-military and done several tours of Afghanistan and Iraq. I said to him, you have PTSD? And he says, I wake up every morning thinking about it, killing people. Just dreadful stuff. And something switched with inside me. Went from resenting meeting this man to just having such incredible compassion for him. A broken man. And I'm thinking, my God, how can I help him? And he said, oh, you know, I haven't been back to my tent. You know, I've got a tent up here somewhere or other. And, and uh, I said, well, I'll drive you back up. He says, I haven't been there for a couple of days. My tent, I don't know if it's still there or somebody's taken all my stuff. And he led me through the dunes at the back here and, and you know, it's not far away from him. And, you know, just this hidden little tent down amongst the dunes and his fishing rod was still there and all his gear. And uh, I said, how long have you been living here? He says, two months. You know, we've got to represent the Father. And just have some compassion for people. The Bible says in several places that Jesus was moved with compassion. We've got the verses there, Alec, you can pull them up. 
when Jesus was moved with compassion, and after Jesus was moved with compassion, then he began to heal the people. Then he fed the 5,000. Then he taught them. He, 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 he operated out of this heart of the father for the, for the sheep, this heart of the shepherd. And sometimes we've got to be moved so we can get moving. And since I met that homeless man, I've had half a dozen conversations with various people that uh, want to do something for the homeless. I met with the, the Sunshine Coast Council Community Development Officer and he says within the next five years, with all the people coming to the coast, we're going to be 4,000 properties short. I thought that's a huge need here on the coast, driving rents up and you know, making it difficult for people. And I met, Deb was talking with another lady who's been homeless, talking about the sports hub where there's 60 residences, mostly all for men. And what happens is they have bust-ups in their relationships. And this is just speaking to me so strongly, if you know my background, that, that you know, the situation is when men have a bust-up, the women keep the kids, and then men can't access their children. This is just breaking my heart. I'm thinking, God, what can we do about this? We've got to do something. And I spoke with another man who wants to do something. I spoke with another who, who's got some, you know, things and, 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 and some community development people and neighbourhood centres and just these, all this stuff going on. There's need in our community, friends, and it's not just for, for coming to church. There's need that somehow or other, as Christians, we've got to step up and make a difference in our world. We've, there, there are uh, men there who, who, you know, they might have been, call them a name and, and you know, so, so say they're idiots and deserve to not have a family, but I've been in that situation where it's difficult to get access to your own children. And you, and you, <coughs> I'm thinking, man, we've got to be able to help them, help our community back to a place of wholeness somehow. Get them saved, get, get something, get God into them. God's got an answer somehow. I don't know how, but God's got an answer. He's got an answer for this thing. You know, I'm talking to somebody else yesterday and they were saying, well, what happens is all the, all the excess land is owned by these large corporations and their business model, so they don't release land because they want to keep prices up. And at the moment, it wouldn't matter if there was excess land because there's, the demand is so big. The builders can't keep up with it. Wayne's not here today. I've been talking to him about it. And you know, just the, the pressure that's in our community at the moment. And, and just what God is... Somehow, friends, we've got to bring an answer. We've got to be people who represent God and allow the compassion of God to flow through us and allow our faith to actually make a difference. Are you hearing me? Come on, friends. This is not just about an, another little message. It's about us having mature faith where we get moved with compassion and see the answers of God come and see God work in people's world and make a difference and bring people back to a place of functionality and wholeness and, and, and worthiness and, and see God just... We need a move of God to realign our values so people stop just getting their lives destroyed with a relationship breakup. How many of you know somebody like that? I mean, probably all of us. It's so, so prevalent in our culture. Now I'm just preaching out of passion here, but I just, I just want you to hear that God has called us to be mature, to have our faith make a difference on this earth. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. And let's not let our barrenness causes just to fold, but to press into God and get the answer from God. We need, we, we need some answers. We need God to come through. We need, we need, I mean, we have lots of need. I'm amazed today at how many people are away that help actually run this Sunday morning service. Thank you, Alec, for stepping up and running the the laptop. Thank you, Bob, for coming and doing that. Thank, thank you, um, Ted and Mara and Janine, for stepping in and, and you know, doing our communion. But for everyone that steps up, Glennis, I want to say thank you for taking on the, the, the prayer 
needs of our people. Thank you. <laughs> so we've got to we've got to let God move us so we can get moving. Thank you, Ray, for working with John to get this men's camp going. It's Fifty men over that sports hub who have just broken lives. My pastor's heart's going, God, what can we do? Jesus, Jesus, I better stop before I turn into a blithering mess. <laughs> Let's be people who mature in faith and grow with God and allow God to, to, to bring the answers of heaven to earth and see God come through and make a difference. Spirit of God, I hope I've encouraged you with some principles and some keys today, but also with some, some passion to see God come through somehow. Now in your world, you have needs. We will stand and agree with you for your needs, but please stand and agree with us for ours. Let's be people who do this together as we stand and fulfill the who we are as the body of Christ, as sons of God, encouraging, supporting, where everyone puts in together and there is no lack. That's how we're designed to do it. We're designed to operate as community. Jesus, I thank you today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that you help us to flourish and grow and be, be, become the mature sons of God that you've called us to be, that we can grow and, and Fulfill your purpose on earth to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth where there is no lack, where there is no uh, uh, tears, where there is no heartache and loss, where there is no devastation, where there is no pain. That's heaven, God. And a promise in that prayer is that it belongs here on earth. And Father, we believe you for it. Somehow or other, you'll take us into that place where we can walk in the resurrection faith it's to believe that you will do what you said you would do, that you will make a way somehow or other. You are our answer, God, and we look to you and we thank you for it. We honour you and love you so very, very much in Jesus' lovely name. Amen, 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 amen. Father, we thank you. There are some people here today. There are people here, and it's like, as I was speaking with Adam, it's like God's doing something here, lining you and, and putting you on a path, and you're going to get traction. But there are people here, I feel like, you, you know, you want, to, you want to get activated, you want to do something, but you don't know how, you don't know which direction, you don't know how to move forward. And, you know, you're just going through life and doing okay, but there's, it's like there's something been touched by you today. How do we move forward, God? How do we, how do we get traction? How do we, how do we press on? That's just what I'm sensing God saying to me. If that's you, please allow me to pray for you. Let's pray together. Let's believe God. There are some people here and, and it's like there's something of the passion that's touched you and you want God to, to, to speak to you in these areas. There are some people here today and, and it's like you, you, you've got hope but you don't know how to step into faith and, and you want God to speak. I want to just impart faith over you and believe God for that. So there are three areas that I want to pray for. Any one of those, please come out. Let me pray for you. Let me believe God and, and, and let his presence come over you and, and, and meet that need. Who are those ones? Please come. Please come. Come on. Let's, let's just let's let God touch us and flow. So it's not just up here, but God imparts something in here. Spirit of God, thank you, man. Come on. There's more. There's more. I'm sure there's more. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Come on, respond, people. Let God touch your will. Let God touch your will. Let God touch your will. 